So at this point, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for this final session. I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker. I've not introduced myself. My name is Ola Jumoke. You can call me Jimmy Ojele. And um, I'm a midwife, and I'm also a doctoral student at the University of South Florida. And I'll read the bio of our keynote speaker tonight. So Dr. Amber Price is the president and CEO of Centara Williamsburg Regional Medical Center in Virginia. She received a Bachelor in Behavioral Science from the University of Maryland, followed by a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Old Dominion University. She completed a graduate degree at the University of Cincinnati, graduating with a Master of Nursing in Midwifery and a Postmaster Certificate in Global Women's Health. She received an Executive Doctorate in Nursing from the Johns Hopkins University with a research focus on change leadership. Dr. Price served as the president of the American College of Nurses Midwife in Virginia and serves as a board member for the March of Dimes and Ronald McDonald House, as well as on state mortality, maternal mortality and perinatal quality boards. In 2017, she won the prestigious Monarch Award for Innovation in Nursing. Originally from Holland, Dr. Price trained in New Zealand and has worked in women's and children's health clinically and as an administrator for more than 30 years. She was named a 2020 Woman to Watch, wow, by Nashville Medical News. Dr. Price is a regular speaker on respectful maternity care and has published numerous articles and book chapters on women's voice in maternal health, trauma-informed care, and respectful maternity care. Her passion and expertise surrounding consent and her unique perspective as a nurse midwife and hospital administrator make her an expert on the patient experience for women of childbearing age. Dr. Price works within her corporation and other organizations on the state and national level to improve outcomes for women and children and to increase access to respectful family center care. And so with you know, so much joy, I'd like to invite Dr. Amber Price to take it away. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it is such an honor to meet with all of you here tonight. And it, it, you know, it's actually difficult to decide what we were going to talk about tonight because there are so many things we can talk about. Um, I know the topics that are near and dear to your heart. I'm a midwife myself. I know what the issues are that we face. Um, I've also practiced globally, so I know that these issues are very similar everywhere. And so I chose to focus tonight on what I've learned as a leader. Um, we have 30 minutes together for me to give you some of those lessons that I've learned along the way um, as, as I moved on from being a doula to the CEO of a healthcare system um, and kind of what I've learned and, and pass some of those learnings on to you while identifying those focus points um, so that you stay really clear on your journey about what those things are um, that are very important to focus on on a global level. I apologize in advance that um, I've worked very hard to make this a global conversation and not a United States conversation. But I also know that sometimes, um, despite my best intent, it might feel um, like I'm not really speaking on a global level. Um, there are some disclaimers here. I tend to use the word woman or birthing person kind of interchangeably in the word patient and the word client. Um, you know, I, I use all kinds of terminology um, all over the board. Um, no intent for disrespect, just kind of how I tend to discuss things. Um, and the other thing that I might say to you is that um, there are things that you might hold dear as concepts in leadership or things that you've really embraced that I challenge um, and that I might push back on a little bit because they tend to be very pertinent to men and not so much to women. Uh, and many uh, women in leadership struggle with these concepts. So. Uh, that being said, we can move on to the next slide. I don't know that I can. Dr. J, kindly help me um, make my presentation. I see it now. Thank you. All right. So the first thing to know is that leadership is intentional. It is not an accidental act. It's something you choose to do. It brings discomfort, it brings ownership and a lot of responsibility with it. In the end, everything is your fault, right? That's uh, what people always tell me, or well, you're the leader. So somehow it's still something you have to own, but it's truly an intentional decision. You don't take a day off from leadership once you're in a leadership role. Um, you need to continue to move forward with that. 
Um, and it's something that you consciously need to be aware of on a daily basis because your impact as a leader and the words you say have a, have a really heavy meaning and an impact on the people that you lead. The second thing to know is that there isn't really a best practice for leadership. There is no book that says this is how you must lead or this is how you should do things. Um, and that's a really good thing because in the end, one of the takeaways you'll get from tonight is that what makes people excellent leaders is if they are genuine, um, honest communicators and find their own way to lead and their own way to be impactful. I'll just give pointers um, along the way. So this is a bit about my own journey. Um, I, uh, as you heard in the introduction, was originally born in Holland. Um, and of course, Holland um, is, a, is a country that's very comfortable with midwifery. It's been ingrained in the Dutch culture for many years. I was born at home. And every year on my birthday, my father, who is in the US now here with me, um, tells me my birth story, how the midwife came in a snowstorm on a bicycle. And those were the stories of my childhood. Um, and so, you know, that's what I thought was normal. And that's where babies are born at home with midwives. That was the story of my life and my family. And my brother was born that way. And my parents were born that way. Um, and so that's what I knew. And so growing up for me, midwifery was just kind of in my bones and a normal part of the fabric of my culture. But I lost my mother at 16 to breast cancer. Um, and my mother uh, was very um, worried and terrified actually of the healthcare system and chose not to get treatment for her breast cancer. So she died a very painful, lonely death at home that I witnessed as a young teenager. And that's where my passion comes from, to create safe spaces for women, uh, build infrastructures and systems that support women and vulnerable patients um, and keeps them safe and, and comfortable. So I began my journey in healthcare very young at 18 as a medical assistant. Um, and you know I was still learning English at the time. Uh, and I uh, first, for, um, I'd been in the United States for maybe a year at that time. And I met my husband who worked for uh, NATO, for International Forces, and then promptly moved back to Europe. So I got my medical assistant, moved all over the world um, in an international career with my husband. So I couldn't uh, finish my education. So I did whatever jobs I could get uh, around the world in military and other hospitals, um, anything from being an EKG tech to um, a doula, and then just moving my way up. And every time we landed somewhere where I could complete an education, that's what I did. So I became a nurse, uh, started in the NICU and then labor and delivery, eventually became a certified nurse midwife, um, completed my training in midwifery in New Zealand while completing my post-masters in global health, um, and then came back to the US and started working in rural health. Uh, fell in love with rural health uh, care, still do. I think I have a great passion for the underserved and rural health, but all of my experience was out of hospitals. So birth centers, home birth, um, really pure birth models uh, and hands-off care models. From there, I moved into academia. I started teaching in a school of medicine um, and worked as an attending in a, in a school of medicine. Uh, and fell in love with the, 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 the process of change leadership, which is a field all unto itself, which I'll touch on tonight, um, because it's a specific skill. Driving change is a specific skill. So I decided to get a doctorate um, in change leadership uh, at Johns Hopkins, which I did, um, and then got recruited by a very large organization to be an administrator. Uh, I went to that organization, uh, became an administrator and vice president, um, and worked within that organization to develop my leadership skills uh, eventually landing as the chief operating officer of their flagship hospital. Uh, and from there got recruited to be the CEO of a healthcare system in Virginia, which is uh, where my family is. And that's where I am today. Along the way, I took the, every opportunity I could to learn, to lecture, to teach, to publish, um, all of those things that get uh, the voices of midwives out in the community. So that's my story. One of the things I urge you to do is to identify what drives you as you focus on your own leadership, because people go into leadership for different reasons. And I've listed some of the common ones here. One of those things is that people you know, really want recognition or somebody to acknowledge they're doing a great job. For some people, it's a power or a control issue. For others, it's heredity, right? Your parents were in a leadership position or someone um, in your family, and it's an expectation that you continue to lead. And then for others, it is necessity. You're the only one in the community and you feel like it's something that's your duty. Uh, for me, my driving goal for leadership is impact. Uh, what makes me happy is when I know that I've had some impact on the care of a vulnerable population. So I know what drives me. In the end, this is an important thing to know when you lead because 
your motivations for leading translate into your ability to drive change. And we'll hit on that a little bit more further down the line. So we know that midwives are topic experts, but globally, midwives are topic experts in, in several really specific categories that others are not necessarily topic experts in. One is in the experience of the patient, trauma-informed care, consent practices, advocacy, outcome improvement and quality, growth, meaning um, you know, really engaging women in their care and bringing them into a practice that continues to grow, and space design, creating spaces that work really well for women, uh, particularly those who uh, have births where there are no interventions, education and teaching and mentoring, emotional intelligence, and there's actually some data on midwives and emotional intelligence, and the care of underserved populations. Uh, we as midwives spend quite a, a lot of time in underserved regions and we have a particular passion for it. All of these things are valuable. They're valuable to health systems, they are valuable to organizations, and these skills that you may not have realized are very marketable on a global level are incredibly important and, um, and not that common in other professions. One of the things I'd like for you to think about is the concept of changing the narrative. And what happens sometimes is when you hone in on what you believe is a problem or something that you want to lead change for, um, is that you're honing in what actually is the wrong problem. And I love this image because this is Medusa with the head of Perseus. And of course, in Greek mythology, the story is flipped, right? Perseus killed Medusa. But if you read back through this story, and I'm not gonna rehash it for, uh, you know, for sake of time, Medusa was abused, um, she was raped, um, she was um, the victim in this story. And so what if that narrative got changed, right? And she was the victor here and she slayed her attacker. Um, that's not how the story is told in history, but that's the truth of the story. And so I challenge everyone to look at every problem that you're tackling and try to understand if you're seeing it from the right light, if you're seeing it with bias, if you're coming at something with a whole lot of emotion or a belief without the evidence behind it. Um, and that is really at the core of change leadership is to truly understand um, what your problem really is. So one day I'll write a book that's called What's Your Problem? Because it's actually a, a pretty significant skill set to hone in on. Um, there's perception and there's reality. Um, you cannot solve a problem that doesn't exist. And I see people do this a lot. They, they think of something that really bothers them um, and they start working on it, but they're frustrated and there's no progress, but it's not the problem. Uh, there was something else at the root cause of that problem and that's going unnoticed and that deeper toxin isn't being addressed. So focus a lot on figuring out what the core of your problem is. Do not let your emotion lead you because emotion affects impact and communication. Um, change leadership and any kind of leadership should come from a place where you can be an optimal communicator and a clear thinker. And in one of my other lectures, I talk a lot about how you can work with your brain and control your brain from um, showing overt emotion or letting emotion lead your conversation. Seeing things from another's viewpoint, uh, most people uh, do things because they think it's the right thing to do. And so immersing yourself in their belief system helps you understand where to drive the change. Big mistake many leaders make is to believe the first thing you hear. People will come in and tell you something and then that becomes your truth. So I caution you to, um, to not do that and really stand back for a minute and be fair as you try to analyze your problem and then to investigate everything because research is in fact very different than your lived experience and what happens is as you live an experience is that you come to believe that it's fact when the research might show you that's absolutely not the fact and the chance that you are wrong is very high so i've identified some global focus areas for midwifery leaders these are not necessarily the focus areas for things that affect women but things that leaders need to tackle because they impact the care of women um, and one of the big ones I'm going to touch on tonight is uh, violence, power, and gender imbalances, because they are global issues um, in the implementation of respectful maternity care. I always think that if we could eradicate power and gender imbalances on a global level, that we would solve women's health and birth overnight. Um, so that, that is a huge focus area for midwives and something to hone in on in your communities as you empower women to be strong and be leaders and have a voice in your systems. Inclusion, diversity, and racism, which are directly impacting the lives of women and children in, in, on, in the world. Um, integration of midwives into mainstream healthcare rather than pulling away into the alternative. We need to keep working to integrate ourselves in healthcare systems because midwifery should be the norm and not the alternative. Respectful maternity care and the importance of using umbrella terminology, again, knowing what the problem is. 
Um, usually it's a bigger zoomed out problem than a tiny focused problem that you're working on. Practice autonomy for midwives, scope and access expansion, development of our future workforce, sustainable practice models, and maternal and neonatal mortality. This information comes directly from the United Nations, um, and it hits on what I said earlier about gender and power imbalances being at the root cause of what is what ails us in, in the care of uh, the vulnerable patients that we care for. And the UN Secretary stated that achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls is the unfinished business of our time, and it is the greatest human rights challenge in our world. And these things relate absolutely directly to the work that we do every single day. Um, so this is the data behind uh, why women often aren't visible in leadership, why it's difficult to drive change, and why our voices are not heard. So if you ask me what makes somebody a great leader, I would say that the ultimate watermark of effective leadership is the ability to drive change. And in order to drive change, you must find a way to harness power and influence others. Um, everybody does that in a different way. People have leadership styles that change. Um, but anyone um, who's committed to this can learn these skills in change leadership. Some fun facts about change is that nobody wants to actually do it. Um, when you ask people who wants change, everyone raises their hand. If you ask who wants to change, nobody raises their hand. And if you ask for somebody to lead the change, everybody disappears. Because ch leading change is the quickest way to not make friends, right? It's difficult for people to change, um, but it needs to happen and it's incredibly important uh, skill set. So if you want to make enemies, try to change something, a, a very famous quote by Woodrow Wilson. Um, and then the point is that everybody wants to change, few are willing to change, and nobody wants to lead the change. I like to lead change, and that's, um, that's what I love to do. So here are some of the core principles of change leadership. Um, some of the ones that you will learn in school, or if you open the book about it on the top line, you identify stakeholders, people who help you do it, uh, people who help you towards your goal always leading with the why, explaining and taking your time and, and, and making sure that people understand why you're doing what you're doing and then supporting them along the way and building teams that then execute that on your behalf. But here's what I've learned in the years that I've done this. Change brings the possibility of anger, disappointment and hurt egos. In fact, I've seen people do everything to sabotage change because it's such a fearful concept for them. Even if they know that it's the right thing to do and they understand the why, people tend to naturally resist change. And people do prefer to remain mired in misery than to head towards a complete unknown. Uh, the unknown terrifies people. What you find is it's easier to say no than yes. And a great example of that is when someone comes in with a birth plan or specific birth wishes, um, people tend to hide behind policies and other things rather than do the very hard work to get this woman to a yes for the birth wishes that she has. What I know is that change has to be forced it is not a natural thing. We saw this with COVID. COVID forced us to change, and you saw the tremendous anger and anguish that came from that on a global level. That's the impact change has on people when it is not something that they want to do. Once you start a change project, do not stop. Uh, do not back paddle. Do not compromise. Keep moving forward towards the change. Um, as long as the change is happening impactfully around you, do not stop. And then we know that change requires bringing people to a discomfort zone, so be prepared for lots of emotion um, and feedback and anger and people trying to stop you. One of my favorite quotes is, the woman with opinions had better develop a thick skin and a loud voice. Um, I had to learn that. It took me um, you know, probably more than a decade to be very comfortable, uh, particularly in the US, where in uh, executive healthcare leadership, only 14% of chief executive officers are women. I often find myself to be the only woman in the space and so I've learned to develop a voice. And then I don't do that by getting louder. I do that by being impactful in my communication. And these are also things that you can specifically learn. Um, so I, I urge you to be prepared for some backlash and for skills developing that needs to happen when you want to lead um, at a higher level. Healthcare doesn't have a women in healthcare problem. In fact, most providers of healthcare are women on a global level, but there is a dire shortage of women in the healthcare leadership role. And I don't mean leadership on, on nursing levels. I mean leadership on a global and executive level. Uh, the people who have the loudest voices in this debate are not women. Um, so women are incredibly underrepresented globally on a leadership level in healthcare. Um, so I urge everyone um, who is interested in being a leader uh, to keep going until you hit a level where you are in a seat to be able to influence. 
here's some specific abilities that I've identified that women need to lead with impact. And here's where that challenge happens. Because there are some really common leadership concepts that we've come to believe are really important. But I will urge you uh, to know that those are tend to be problems that men have. So there, for example, is a huge um, focus on humility in leadership. Women don't really struggle with humility. Uh, women tend to not walk around the earth telling people how wonderful and great they are with great confidence. Um, so these concepts in leadership are often written by men for men, um, where this bravado and this aggression is not helping them as leaders. And so putting some of these concepts to the side that we've been raised with as women as really valuable and things that we should embrace um, is sometimes difficult. Another one of those is, is coming at something with a, you know, just being grateful or having gratitude or being a servant. Um, all of these words are terrible things for women to embrace and kind of keeps us in a place where our voices aren't heard and where our value isn't shared. So as I look at a list of things that are incredibly important for women to embrace as they lead, it is it's having unwavering courage. Unfortunately, courage is more easily harnessed when you have nothing to lose. And we all know that many women have a whole lot to lose and are in situations um, where they're actually under attack or, or are pushed to a limit. Um, so I always tell people, find a way to have a, a something to fall back on as you lead with courage um, so that you feel more courageous and you don't hold back and you don't stop. Negotiation skills. Um, we know that people who take interviewing classes and lessons on interviewing develop great negotiation skills as well. Building your confidence. Discipline. Uh, discipline is very different than motivation. Discipline is doing something because you have to every day, even if you don't feel like it, um, and, and getting a, a regularity around that. Uh, Self-awareness. Know who you are and lead from a genuine place. Um, influence. Learning how to build that and how to impact systems around you. Learning agility. Right. Open your mind. Change the way you learn. Be open to learning new things. Pick up what works from somebody that you work with. Let go of things that you've learned in the past so that you don't hold yourself back as you develop your leadership skills. Resilience. Women are great at it, uh, but it does go on the list. Integrity. Uh, leading from a place that isn't from uh, something that serves you, but leading from a place that serves your communities directly and keeping a, a focus on that. Um, not having a place where you have a dishonest agreement in a conversation, right? Going along with group think because you think it, it's safer. Always speaking up when it's the right thing to do and never compromising. Decisiveness. This is something that women uh, have to develop and work on. Uh, being very decisive in a, in a communication, not letting people interrupt you, and being very clear about what it is that you want. And then vision and clear direction. Three, three top points here. The use of routine anger or tears cause people to shut down. We as midwives are incredibly tolerant of emotion and we welcome it because we know that these vulnerabilities help us help our patients. But in a business setting, these are confusing. Um, and so sometimes things that we're very comfortable with in our daily life do not work when we are leaders. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't be genuine or use emotion or feelings in your conversation. Actually, I encourage that. But use of anger or tears really do cause people to shut down. Men do not know what to do with it. Many women do not know what to do with it. Do not overvalue expertise because it's the quickest way to stay in your job. And what I mean with that is once you're a topic expert on something, then people need you there and they don't want to move you. But having a very broad skill set to where you can move and be agile as you move up the leadership ladder is incredibly important. So try not to get boxed in. I'm a midwife, but I lead a hospital system. And there is no CEO of, of OB or women's health. There's only a CEO of a whole hospital. So open your mind and learn to lead throughout a healthcare system uh, so that you can impact the most vulnerable in our society. And if you always make yourself smaller or diminish yourself or don't talk about your value, you may want to consider how this response actually serves you. And I'm here to say that more than likely it's not serving you at all. Men are very comfortable here. Women really struggle with this ability. So how women rise, what you need to know about that. So humility, as I said, makes women invisible and it is not a woman problem. Uh, learn how to show your value while still feeling very comfortable in the way that you do that. Um, if you deserve a promotion, go ask for one. Um, if there's something that's important, speak up uh, and learn to have these communications with impact. 
break the habit of turning the spotlight on others. Women, in particular midwives, tend to empower the people around us, but often at the cost of ourselves and making ourselves invisible. Uh, you can be somebody who cares for everyone in the community and yet have a powerful voice and influence in your sphere. If claiming credit for your work is hard for you, that's something that's going to cost you throughout your career. So learn to develop that skill. What we know is that women worry a lot about being liked um, and, into, and, fi and fitting into a community or being part of a community and liked, whereas men have a lot of focus on being respected. Being liked isn't as important. Um, so I urge women to kind of move away from the fear that people don't like you. Um, I promise you, as you become impactful and you lead others around you, that, be that becomes less important because that gratification and that, that connection with your community comes from a very different place. But it is a fearful place for women um, if you're not liked. Change drivers are not liked. People who are very strong and push change are not necessarily liked. They are respected. Um, and then that turns around into a different um, stream of, of connection with the people around you. And women get promoted by working very hard, whereas men can actually ask for promotions uh, which are granted. I've asked for promotions in my past life that were not granted and I knew I had to move on um, because my hard work wasn't enough. Um, but women as a rule uh, have to work very, very hard and sometimes twice as hard as men to get promoted or noticed as leaders. There's a different standard. So I get asked all the time, you know, I've been trying to change things for 20 years in my community. Um, you know, I've, I've done all the things that you advise. I've worked on all the things that you say that we need to work on. Um, but why is nobody listening to me? I, I do all of those things and I think I'm really good at it. So one of the things that I'd like you to look at is to see if you're actually holding back because you're worried about the repercussions from the change that you're driving. Uh, I find that people have clear boundaries about what they're not willing to cross, but sometimes you have to loop over that next boundary um, and really challenge yourself and put yourself in an uncomfortable situation in order to push the change through. What is your skill set? Um, there's an actual defined skill set for change leaders. I, I quoted one here, but there are many um, that really help you go through the steps of change leadership so that you're not just winging it. You're not just doing it on your own, but you really follow those guide pathways um, that help you get from point A to point B. One of the things I'll bring up is that Patricia Benner, uh, who was a, a nursing theorist in the United States, um, has, a, has a concept called from novice to expert, which is a theory that I use quite a bit in change leadership in healthcare. And the premise of that theory is that it takes about five years for a healthcare worker to become an expert. Um, it takes about two years just to be comfortable, but five years to become an expert. And every time I ask somebody with five or more years experience to change the way they provide healthcare, they absolutely panic. Um, it is a known fact that when you ask an expert to become a novice, that's the place of most anxiety for healthcare leaders. So learning these things around change theory or, or Benner's theory or change leadership theory are important things. There are articles, there are books. Um, I'm always available for mentoring and counseling on these things um, that help you build that skill set itself. So if it's not working, you may be missing a skill, so I urge you to explore that. Are you invisible? I think that midwives often think they're very visible particularly those who work in large health systems and see many patients. But what I've learned as a CEO of a health system is that I cannot see the midwives on my spreadsheets or my finance sheets or my data sheets. Um, it is, it is a, a very difficult thing for midwives to stay visible, particularly in environments where there are regulatory issues. Another question to ask yourself is if you're seeking out feedback or if you want to be validated. I often have people who do mentoring sessions with me who want to tell me a story for 25 minutes and want me to validate um, that what they're doing is correct, when really what you should be open to is feedback from somebody who has successfully driven change, particularly in the realm um, that we work in. Um, so be open to feedback, see feedback as a gift, and really challenge yourself to see if you're just looking for people who agree with you, or if you're looking for somebody to help you uh, go to that uncomfortable place where you have to do something to change yourself to be a more impactful leader. And then ask yourself if you want to drive change or if you just want someone to hear you and have somebody else drive the change. Now that's okay to do, totally fine. Um, and yes, go Marcus, good for you. Um, if we could encourage people to show more emotion, I'm reading Marcus's wonderful comment here, um, we would change the world for sure. Um, 
If you just want to be heard and have someone else drive, then find somebody who can lead the change with you and you become the stakeholder and you become that support person for them for implementation. Sometimes for women in particular, uh, when you are not in a safe space, that is the way to drive change um, and really lean on somebody who can successfully do that for you and step back uh, and make sure that the change becomes more important than the credit for the change. So what's up next for midwives? Continuous change and challenging ourselves to push change forward um, is a really important concept because I know, and you all know, um, who work in the birth world, that we've been trying to tackle the same things for many years. We all see re respectful maternity care issues around the world. We see coercion, we see abuse, we see consent practices that are not good. Um, we see midwives being restricted in their practice not being allowed to have a voice, not being allowed to have autonomy, when we know that we can have such an impact on a global level. So don't give up, keep pushing, and know that continuous change is the only option. And when something does not work, then you need to move on to something else and keep trying to do that. I see so much burnout in midwives. I understand why that's happening. But on a global level, it is very important that we do not allow our voices to be silenced. So I urge you to keep trying to change things um, along your journey. We're facing physician shortages, and that is becoming a really, really important uh, talking point because it will position you in such a way um, that you are becoming invaluable in the healthcare system. That's the change that's going to push things over the edge. And not only do we have a physician shortage coming up, but the other very interesting thing that is happening, and I, I'm speaking really on the United States level, but I imagine this is a global problem, is that the physicians of 30 years ago, who were the dedicated physician birthing babies in a community doing 250 births a year, are all retiring or are passing away. And the new generation of physicians is looking for a very balanced home life. And what we're seeing in the United States is that the average new obstetrician is not doing more than 120 births a year. So for every doctor we've lost who did a lot, they're going to look to replace them with two physicians. And that's not going to happen in a physician shortage. So knowing that your skill set is actually going to be recognized out of an absolute necessity for coverage in the community is an important hope point for midwives. My caveat for that is make sure that you are a meaningful partner in that integrated care, that you take care of all women, that you take care of people with all risk conditions, that you do not let arbitrary rules around what normal is supposed to look like hinder you and embrace an optimal skill set. As far as your scope will allow you to practice, that's how far you should push to practice so that you can be a meaningful partner um, to others in the system and integrate well and not abandon your patients to a different part of the healthcare system. So that is one of those things I strongly urge. Practice standardization. Really important that we all understand what great practice looks like um, and that, that we're not fighting each other or fighting something um, that is, is a, a concept that's very difficult for the rest of the healthcare system to understand. As we standardize midwifery, so acceptance will increase and so it gets easier to integrate. I did include the ICM definition of the midwife. I am sure you've seen this several times today. If not, it is easy to find, um, but there is a standardized definition that, that should be globally adopted um, that starts the conversation around standardization of our practice. We tend, to, what midwives tend to do is actually close our birth spaces off to the rest of the healthcare system because we're protected and we create sacred spaces for our patients because we know that disruptions can actually be traumatic. But what I urge people to do is the opposite. What I urge people to do is creating transparency because by being visible and showing people what we do and setting boundaries around that for the women we care for, right? So there's no intrusion in that. That's how we create um, systems where we are integrated um, I, I've published several articles around a very predictable cycle of midwifery implementation once we open these doors and create transparency. Uh, within the first three months, you never see that person in your room again. Once they've built trust, they disappear. Uh, and it actually increases those trust bases. Uh, technology, demand change. I am filming a BBC documentary on this next week, so look for that. But I've taken the, uh, the global platform of saying that technology is inadequate. What we are doing right now is conforming birth to the available technology. And there's very little thought process from us about it because we're assuming that this is the best it's going to get. No, technology is atrocious. 
and it's been developed for people who are looking at a tracing from their phone and the definition of great technology means that I can see it from my desk. That is not the definition of great technology. It should be painless, it should be non-invasive, it should be accurate, it should promote mobility and autonomy for the patient and it should promote optimal outcomes and not decrease optimal outcomes. So I have challenged GE and other organizations globally to develop new technology. Um, and I urge you to have that same conversation because it's something people understand. Needing better technology um, is a very reasonable ask. And I will tell you that what we have available to us today is absolutely bare bones. Um, this type of technology would not be accepted in an operating room. It wouldn't be accepted in a cardiology service. We need to fight for technology that supports us and that promotes optimal outcomes at the same time. And it may look very different than what we're working with today. We want technology to help us. We don't want it to hinder us or restrict us. Epigenetics. If you're interested in epigenetics and birth, I urge you to read Michelle O'Don's work. Um, if you've never read his work, it is absolutely eye-opening. Um, he is now in his very late 90s, but he is a phenomenal um, physician and teacher of evolutionary biology. And what he is proposing is that the, the stuff that midwives have been saying, and I said it, I'm one of those people, where birth can't change that quickly, right? Where, where, where our genetics are not changing so quickly, uh, birth can't possibly be broken. This is an innately natural process. He's challenging that, that the work of the, and, and the influences of the past 50 years have had a very rapid impact on birth. And birth isn't, isn't as easy and as uncomplicated and straightforward as it used to be. And that there's actually great influences on our genes and the way that we birth moving forward. So to be aware of that and position ourselves well to take care of higher and higher and higher risk women who do not easily birth and develop the skill sets and the networks to support them. And then, as I said before, expanding the definition of normal. It's a great question, Celine. You can standardize care and individualize care as well. Standardization is really more an under, a global understanding of what midwives do and what they're capable of. Individualizing care happens at the patient level. It's a great question. All right. I actually, uh, I think I finished right at 30 minutes. So uh, I have plenty of time for questions, I believe. Thank you all for paying attention. Thank you. Wow. Wow, wow, that was, I, I don't know how, can we just describe this session in the chat box? What did you think? And look at the, look at the flame you have on your last slide, Dr. Price, like fire <laughs> everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please, we can start putting our questions, comments. I know there are a lot of comments already in the chat box and um, people already pouring out some love already. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Price, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm trying to look through the um, chat if there is any question, but I see more of comments. People are resonating with what you have shared. Thank you. Is that a question? Sorry, I saw something. I just want to be sure if it's a question or not. Okay. Yeah. Now remember, everybody. I am no different than you. I am a midwife. I am an out of hospital birth midwife. I've just, I'm doing the same thing today that I did one woman at a time. I just step back one step each time. I am a proud midwife. When I introduce myself as a CEO, I tell them I'm a midwife. The other thing I didn't do is I didn't get an MBA and I didn't get an MHA and all of these business degrees. I insisted that that was unnecessary. I stayed on the path that helped me lead best. And the reason I moved up in the system is because I could deliver the results, because I learned the skills that drive change and that help companies be successful um, on the level that companies need to be successful. So you're no different than I am. Uh, and know that you can harness those skills and you don't have to step outside of who you are or what you know to be true as a midwife. Um, stay a proud midwife along the way on your leadership journey. Just develop those skills that I brought up tonight. Wow, thank you so much, thank you so much. So I see a question in the chat box and I'll take that before we'll leave tonight. Uh, Marcos is asking, when did you know that you could approach more established stakeholders to go for the change? I think that's a question from Marcos. Yeah, the problem is that stakeholders don't identify themselves, right? Nobody's lining up to go, hey, we'd like some change. Um, but the, the reality is that somebody notices a big problem. 
And right now, of course, a big global and United States discussion is maternal mortality. It's a big problem. You hone in on the problem, which we know in the United States is really heavily based in racism and culture. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work around trying to figure out what it is. We think that's what it is because we know that black women are four times as likely to die. White obese women are living, black obese women are not. So there's something going on in, in, in racism and being able to hear and see uh, and see that. So that's now you know your core problem. You now have to go find those stakeholders. You have to drum them up because you can't do things by yourself. Now, I've come into several systems where I had zero stakeholders and I'm my only stakeholder, but I'm in a position of influence and power and I just say, this is what we're going to all work on as a team and this is what it is that's what i meant with if you start out in change leadership you need people who support you in big groups and the higher up you get in leadership and the more influence and power you have the easier it is to lead that yourself because you're in an influential position to do so you'll find stakeholders along the way um, they will come in but you can start a project by saying this is the evidence that i've discovered we know this is a fact and we are going to take the following steps um, and then i urge you not to peel back and to keep doing that because once you've driven change you will soar in leadership there are very few people who are great at leading change and that is a hallmark of a leader and it will be noticed um, so i urge you to try it and do it even if you don't have great support wow thank you that's so so excellent i have a question that i would like to take before we wrap up this session um as the shama is asking what are what are your personal coping mechanisms for for when you are in a lonely place in the church oh my God. Yeah. good question um so you know one of the things i say all the time it's a really rude question to ask somebody about work-life balance but you asked it so well because that's what at its core right we choose how much time we want to spend on our work and how much time we need um, to focus on ourselves to regroup and regenerate. I know for myself that I have to disappear. I have to go away from technology, phones, everything. So I am a solo hiker. Uh, I go off in the wilderness on my own, completely decompress. My favorite thing to do is to be, you know, 10 miles inland somewhere standing on a 300 foot waterfall and swimming all alone uh, with nobody with me. And that's what I do. Um, so I have extreme relaxation and then I'm on 24 seven when I'm working because my passion and what I love to do and because I know that I'm driven by impact is to not let go of what I'm building and working on. Uh, that impact is, is important to me and that feeds me and it makes me happy. So I throw all of my energy into it. And that's a decision you can make. Not everyone is in a position to do that. Those with young children, those with other demands on them, um, but you, it, there's a stigma in that, right? When you're a mom and you let someone else watch your kids because you have a purpose and a passion outside of that. So I urge people to not ask that question, uh, except in the way that you so beautifully asked it. What is it that you need to recharge yourself? Well done. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can, uh, Dr. Jane, can you make me the moderator so that I can move this slide to the next slide? Thank you so much. In summary, I would describe um, Dr. Price as a true leader, yeah, that's that's how I'll describe you, you know, a leader who has, my notes are full here, like I was taking down notes and somebody said your mentees are fortunate. Yes, and I take this as a very golden opportunity you know, to learn a lot. You know, she has shared from her wealth of experience. She has literally walked the talk. And that's why it's so easy for her to share about, you know, these significant changes and, you know, with the results to show for it. You know, I have so much point. You can't take a day off in leadership. Like, what was that? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, we are coming to the end. Um, did I miss a question or we just move on? Let me see. Hope I didn't miss a question. Okay, basically, a lot of comments, people loving up on you in the chat box. Thank you so much.